you very much, Paul, for the introduction, and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, so the decal that I'm pursuing is much uh, part of a much larger, wider piece of work that I thought I'd mention, given that's a key theme of this whole webinar series about how we, we fit into the bigger scheme of things. Um, it's called Fakes, Fabrications and Falsehoods in Global Health. It's a investigator award um, from the Wellcome Trust that's run by uh, Professor Patricia Kingori as part of the Ethos Centre. And uh, we're a cross-disciplinary team that's looking at the concept of pseudo in global health. Um, Bakery, how it manifests in, in all of its different forms um, and the ethical implications of that. And um, my interest, if I can get my slide to progress, there we are, um, is in medical products, as you won't be surprised to hear as a pharmacist. Um, what I'm going to be talking to you about today isn't the results of the study, given that I'm at the, the design phase. Um, I do discuss these ideas in greater depth in the paper that's um, shown there on the left if you're interested in it, which is based on literature and my experiences as the head of pharmacy at various different international and governmental organizations. Um, in terms of design, um, I am using qualitative research methods because what I'm really interested in is, like the old um, mentioned, is understanding the real world implications of what's going on, the world that people inhabit when they're faced with uncertain circumstances in terms of perhaps not being able to trust the quality of medical products that they're using. Because I think in circumstances like this, it can be um, easy to forget that while we're talking about big, grand global problems, life is still going on for the individuals who are working in healthcare. They still need to make decisions about how to deliver health, how to provide patient care, despite the fact that they might not be able to rely on the result of a rapid diagnostic test that they've just used or they might not be sure of the efficacy of a treatment that they're about to provide their patient. And so that can throw up ethical dilemmas for them in terms of, well, what do I do? And I thought I'd describe that a little bit more through means of a scenario and this question of, well, what do I do? So the photograph that you have in front of you is, is quite a personal one to me. It's one that I received when I was head of pharmacy at a large international non-governmental organization um, from one of my colleagues in Afghanistan. And it shows the burnt out shell of our regional warehouse in Kunduz province that um, stored all of the medical supplies for the, the health program there. And the health program was enormous. It was outsourced from the government um, for providing all secondary primary health care for the entire region. So that's for a population of about 1 million people. And uh, the question that I asked myself was, what do I do? What do we do? Um, as head of pharmacy, obviously, medicine quality is at the forefront of my mind. And um, the supplies that were in this warehouse were received from a quality assured source from a Netherlands supplier. And all of our health centers had, had stock, but as soon as they needed replenishment in a couple of weeks time, there wouldn't be anything to give them. And the stock from our Netherlands supplier was going to take probably six, nine, perhaps 12 months to get into country because we were facing enormous importation challenges lots of bureaucracy and, and constantly changing requirements. But what I knew is that um, I did not have the, the faith of procuring um, good quality medicines on the national market because of problems of weak regulation, corruption, a rife black market. Um, and so the challenge there is thinking about, well, you know, do I buy or not buy? If we don't buy from the national market, um, then our patients won't have any medicines to receive but if we do then potentially we'll be buying medicines of poor quality that could have a substantial public health implications for them and, and the whole community and so a really sticky situation but now i'd like you to think that rather than being the head of pharmacy in that situation perhaps you're the security officer in afghanistan and you'll have a slightly different lens to look at this problem through and that you're responsible for the safety of all staff in Kunduz province. And what you're aware of is that staff have been reporting that they've been receiving uh, threats of assassination from uh, the Taliban, who are unhappy with the supply chain problems and the importation issues that I've referred to. And that if there's no medicines in the facility and they can't be treated and their families can't be treated, well, that's really unacceptable. Um, and these threats are very real. So as a security officer, how do you balance up these two problems? The, the, the risk of procuring poor quality medicines on the national market and potentially affecting the lives of um, uh, patients and individuals in the communities that you're serving, 
how do you how do you balance that against the lives of the staff that you need to protect and the the very visible issue of stockouts compared to the relatively invisible problem of substandard affordable medicines? And let's take another view again. Let's pretend that we're the head of the the organisation with a CEO, and we hear about this problem, obviously, and we're concerned about una being unable to meet our commitments to the Ministry of Health and deliver healthcare if we don't have any medical products. But on the other hand, we're also very concerned about the fact that we might procure poor quality medical products and, and distribute them to beneficiaries and the negative reputational impact that might have. And for a charity, really, reputation is everything. Reputation dictates the funding that you receive. And actually, if there's a large reputational fallout from this, well, perhaps then um, that might affect funding streams. Um, for all of our other programs where we're delivering really essential healthcare to vulnerable communities. How do we weigh up the lives of those two different populations? And last, and then I'll move on, I think you're getting the point, but um, let's think of, of someone outside of the, the organisation altogether, perhaps we're a donor, perhaps we're with, say, USAID, um, the US uh, government aid programme. And we're responsible for um, the responsible distribution of funds to various different uh, programs around the world. And in order to be fiscally responsible and spend public money responsibly, we need to account for where every single dollar goes. We need to do due diligence with various different suppliers. And although we're keen to ensure that aid programs continue, we also can't necessarily risk the, the problem of giving millions of dollars worth of replacing these medicines into a national market where we're unsure of the suppliers and, and perhaps what, what links they have or, or, or their, um, their standards. And I think, so hopefully that shows that we talk about substandard and falsified medicines, perhaps in a slightly binary way, but in the real world that it can have um, a very complex and nuanced problem that can be seen through a number of different lens, through a number of different responsibilities. And what this question is really pointing to is what do I do is that actually who does have the moral authority to decide the answer to that question? Who should determine the quality of medical products that are received from the beneficiary? Clicking up in front of you and on the slides here is an example of a few of the different actors that may have been involved in the delivery of this health programme in Afghanistan, from policymakers, donors, um, individuals that design the programme, uh, people that audit the, the manufacturers and suppliers to ensure that they're quality assured, those that procure the medicines, those that deliver them, regulators to ensure that the um, uh, medicines that come into the country or, or are produced in the country of sound quality, uh, the healthcare system who's recruited and, and, and finally the prescribers. And each one of these could, could feasibly be, um, have some responsibility for quality for, at their feet. But also I think that um, the decisions that they make can have an influence on the medical quality that is, is finally received by the patient, whether or not they necessarily realise it. And ethical challenges and ethical dilemmas can arise at any single point in this um, very long chain. Like I said, this isn't comprehensive, but this long chain of actors who have sort of an accumulative potential effect on the quality that's received by the end user. So, for example, at one end of the chain, we have policymakers. And perhaps you're a policymaker with a real agenda for universal health coverage and the challenges um, for access to medicines across the globe, which is a real a real problem obviously but if you champion a, a program of universal health coverage without necessarily um, attending to the importance of quality if you ask people to do more with the same resources then something has to give and an unintended consequence of pushing for greater availability could be the reduction of quality at the under, other end of this chain we've got prescribers so say you're a prescriber in Kunduz province at that time and you have a concern about one of the quality of some of the medicines that you're administering to patients. How much should you tell them? It's something that's come up already, um, Kerlin mentioned in terms of the risks of vaccine hesitancy in terms of talking about um, quality issues. Well, how much should you inform your patient in terms of um, uh, the quality issues. You might scare them, you might reduce their acceptance, um, but surely you need to inform them of um, any considered risks due to their autonomy and, and, and ensuring an informed consent 
Um, the area that I'm interested in um, for this project, uh, for this piece of research is procurement right in the middle. I think it's a really interesting decision point where upstream of that, we're thinking of a, a conceptual project, a product, like we need paracetamol. But at the point of procurement, that product becomes real, it becomes actual, you receive a batch number, you receive an expiry date, um, and then you have an actual thing in front of you. And I think the decisions that go around moving from the conceptual to the actual is a very interesting space. And um, for this project, this is what I'm looking at. So I find it very interesting in understanding how different actors could consider the various different dimensions of priorities and bring them to bear in making a procurement decision. So if you think back to that burnt out warehouse that we looked at, obviously cost is going to be an enormous pressure. Um, flying goods out in, its, in itself at the time that this was taken would probably taken cost about three hundred three hundred thousand dollars and the cost of drugs and, and medical devices may have been the same again and you don't sort of find that down the back of a sofa so in terms of, of, of trying to replenish that warehouse as cheap as possible that would probably be a, a quite a, a large consideration but also speed i've mentioned that you know we need to replace these medicines as quickly as possible so that healthcare can continue who is going to be the supplier that will be able to replenish and supply us as quickly as possible or perhaps accessibility is important. We don't have a warehouse anymore. Maybe we prefer to use a pharmacist that's down the road to provide medicines directly to healthcare centres on a weekly basis until we get ourselves up and running with a warehouse again. Or perhaps familiarity. We're not going to be able to provide the medicines that we were previously that our staff are familiar with. So rather than buying something in a different language, you know, maybe we want to buy something locally in Pashti that we're, we're confident that they can, can be given safely. Or again, how about payment terms? Um, you know, it's going to take a little while for our cash flow to return to try and replenish these medicines. Maybe we want a supplier that's going to be, give us quite generous payment terms. They'll give us the, the goods now, but they'll allow us to pay in three months' time. And ever present with the quality. And these are just some of the dimensions. Again, it's, it's not comprehensive, but um, I think you will get a sense of that it's, it's unlikely that all of these dimensions are going to be achieved for the scenario that I've just presented. So therefore, what do we prioritise and what do we compromise? And that's really what I'm hoping that my research will contribute to, trying to answer these kind of really challenging questions, because at the moment there's very little guidance about how to navigate these kind of moral mazes, because every different situation is quite unique. And it's, it's as you can imagine, there's lots of different um, agendas and priorities and, and expectations from a host of different actors. So I'm hoping that the research that I'm conducting in terms of understanding this and then in future working towards answering these kind of ethical questions will hopefully mean that decision making is done in a more evidence based and ethical manner for the benefit of um, patient and, and healthcare gender. Um, thank you for your attention. Um, I look forward to any questions.